Hello and welcome to Face in the Crowd podcast number 10. This time we are talking to Liam Cormier from Canadian hardcore stroke metal band Cancerbacks. Hello Liam. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Yeah, I'm just hanging out. Having a oh, lazy man. Sunday. That's I've what been it's riding about. dirt bikes the last two days, so I'm Sweet. feeling physically physically pretty exhausted. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's got to be, that's got to take it out of you, isn't it? Yeah, I I definitely, like, have been trying to ride a ton to, like, stay in shape. I feel like riding dirt bikes feels like playing metal shows. <laughs> it's like a hardcore cool. show. You yeah, there's not, there's not many of them going on at the moment, unfortunately, is there? Yeah, exactly. So I gotta stay in. I gotta stay in some kind of shape. Oh man, yeah, I, I don't think I could ride a dirt bike. I couldn't even ride a BMX. I think <laughs> I'm so bad in shape if I stop playing football. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those things. Like you kind of gotta like force yourself. I I like don't go to the gym or anything like that. I'm not like one of those kind of dudes. I could never like put on like running shoes and run around the block. So I like. Yeah, I'm like, oh, okay, I got to ride a motorcycle or skateboard or, like, do something to, yeah. like, stay in shape. Yeah, That's why I like fun, being in a band. It's, like, free workout. Yeah, totally, totally. How's the rest of the guys doing? All good? Yeah, everybody's good. We're spread out all across Canada. So I'm, like, super far. So I haven't actually seen any of the guys in person since uh, since March. Hmm, hmm. You know, but, it's a big, uh, big place, good. isn't yeah, it? Yeah, everybody's... What's that, sorry? It's a big place, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Canada's huge. <laughs> Compared to the UK. <laughs> Blimey. Yeah, yeah, we're in the UK. We're down in... Um, you've been here, actually, not so long ago. We were in a, um, in a town called South End. You played at a um, place called Chinneries down the seafront. Yeah, yeah, we actually, we actually used to hang out in South End all the time. Our, oh, cool. Um, yeah, our tour manager was from... Uh, was from Rochford. Oh, wow. Rochford. So we, <laughs> oh, so we used to hang out in, like, Lee and, like, South yeah. End all the time. And same, like, Daniel P. Carter lives there. And yeah. we used to always play shows with, like, the Hexes boys. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Pretty yeah, cool. we're in Lee now. We're, yeah, we're about five minutes from South End. So. Yeah, that's the thing that we would call it south end and then people will be like well actually this coffee shop's in lee and i'll be like oh sorry <laughs> and same with our friend he would be like oh i'm actually from rochford and you're like oh so sorry <laughs> don't bother us mate it doesn't bother us how was that gig at the uh, chinneries for you had to find that oh into, man into the venue we played chinneries. Play chinneries like three three times now four times have you i didn't know that yeah yeah, we always have a blast there. Uh, yeah. It's such a wicked bar. And I feel like it's close enough, too, to a lot of other places that people will, like, people even will take the train from London to come to a South End show. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it used to be a little bit like kids would like, when they could put on, like, local bands and things, no one ever wants to play last. The crowd really thins out because everyone's got to get the train or the last bus or whatever which is just yeah. one of those things. So, yeah, they call it like, the, you know, it's like the night shift um, playing the, uh, playing, you know, if, you, if, you, if you're headlining, it's not like, it's not like a good thing in so. Yeah, half your, <laughs> half your crowd in the casino in, doing Jager Bowl. That's the one thing, though, like playing <laughs> in the UK, like every show, like has to be done at 11 o'clock. Like it's yeah. so, cr- it's so crazy, the like bar curfews. Because like, mm. Every like in Canada, we play at like two in the morning sometimes. You know, like depending on the bar. Like, yeah. You're like playing until people like can't drink anymore. Uh-huh. And so yeah, for us to like tour in the UK and be like, okay, you're on stage at like nine thirty. We're like, ah, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> An early night. Yeah, it's so easy. You're at the travel lodge by midnight. <laughs> travel lodge, mate. You should insist on a holiday in. They're much nicer. <laughs> <laughs> no way, just a waste of money. <laughs> just somewhere to sleep, isn't it? If yeah. Maybe, if you play at 2 a.m. over here, you'd have a bunch of rabid animals. The English going hard, man. You know, we, there's, the second you get let into one of these venues, it's just like drink as much as you can, as fast as you can. It's, it's dangerous. <laughs> 
yeah, it's the scene. Everybody's got to work the next day, so they got to get as hammered as they possibly can. That's it. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. So yeah, so you have. I like nice... it. Oh, that's why we. That's why we keep coming back. Yeah. It's... Yeah. <laughs> so um, me, me and myself and Sam were were in the uh, tent watching you guys at download last year. Saw the whole set. Um, brilliant. Oh, serious. <laughs> Yeah, we saw was it you, you in the Bronx of the Bronx then you? Oh, we saw you both, didn't we? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I feel like we we now like always play festivals like the same stage as those guys. It'll be yeah, like us before the Bronx or Bronx before us. So yeah, the yeah. last couple summers we've kind of been like all over the UK and Europe, like the Cancer Bats Bronx stage. <laughs> that's pretty cool though is it not like nice kind of brotherhood kind of thing you'll get on well oh it's the kind of it's the best we we met those guys we toured with them and back in 2007 so we've we've definitely been good homies with those guys for a long time mm-hmm. who's your favorite band to tour with favorite band to tour with yeah who's the most fun uh, man we toured with a lot of great bands um that's a that's like a toss-up between like Anti Flag, Alexis on Fire, Billy Talent, Rise Against. Man, those dudes all rule. Nice. I mean, I feel like everybody we get along with. Like, I think about like touring with Washi Sleeps. Like, that was awesome. Yeah. Like, we always make homies on tour. Touring with Gallows was awesome. Oh, but, yeah. touring with Bring Me the Horizon. We toured with Bring Me the Horizon a ton. Like, yeah, I don't know. I feel like we we make friends with everybody. That's good. Well, you're all such likable characters. Do you know what I mean? It's all good, man. All yeah. Good. Oh, Every Time I Die. We've toured with Every Time I Die a ton. Those oh, they're a great really band, are not they? Yeah, I'd love to tour with those dudes more. Mm. I feel like our schedules need to... Uh, well, now nobody has a schedule, so uh, it's pretty easy. <laughs> yeah. I've seen Billy Talent. I've seen those. I've seen yeah. the tent. Yeah, they were awesome. Yeah, same much. Yeah, people. they're the best. Like, they're such good dudes. We've known them. Those guys in Alexis on Fire, we've, like, toured with both bands, like, pretty much around the whole world. Mm. Yeah, I'm a, I'm quite a big fan of Alexis. I saw um, I saw Dallas doing his acoustic thing. It was the last gig I went to before lockdown in March. He played the... Oh, the, yeah? He played the London Palladium. Oh, cool. That was pretty cool, you know, it was a really nice gig, and then I, I sort of pumped into him outside after, so I had a little chat to him, that was, that was quite nice, yeah, it was all right. Yeah, it I got is. to see City in Colour played uh, in Halifax, where I'm living now, at the yeah. end of 2019, uh, mm-hmm. they came through on tour, and yeah, it was the last day of their tour, so we all hung out, and um, yeah, it was a good time. Thanks. Uh, let me ask this. Um, obviously, you, you, uh, we're called uh, our podcast. We called it "Face in the Crowd," and the reason we did that was we wanted to sort of like um, put across people's um, like first gigs and first experiences of music, things like that. Oh um, yeah, so for sure. What we always ask um, is, uh, what was the first gig you went to? Um, I mean, I went to a bunch of. I grew up in like a college town, like in a university town in Waterloo, so. I got to uh, to see, like, a bunch of, like, indie rock bands, like, kind of, like, playing in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Um, and saw, like, stuff like that. So when I was, like, 11, like, I remember starting to go to, like, we could buy tickets and go to shows and, like, hang out in a bar. Because uh, for some reason, all shows were, like, all ages shows because we were so young. Right. Or maybe they just, like, I don't know. I don't know why. But we were, like, going to shows when we were really young. But I remember seeing, like, yeah, just, like, indie rock, Canadian indie rock bands. But the mm-hmm. first, like, show show I remember going to was I remember seeing, like, Rancid uh, when I was, like, 15 years old. I saw Rancid and Rocket from the Crypt. And I always think of that as, like, the first, like, show I kind of went to. Yeah. Because yeah. I feel like that was, like, like, it was, like, a band that had, like, a music video and like there were you know like they were kind of like a bigger deal at that point mm. that's where i felt like it was like last like just seeing local bands like open for somebody at a bar and like yeah. actually going to see like a real show was like when i went to see that ah, that's cool oh, i remember them rocket from the crypt they were great oh mate. dude th- that album that like scream dracula scream like that that record like changed my life i yeah. feel like rocket from the crypt was like such a huge band for me in that they didn't fit in any category 
Mm. So like as a 15 year old, like 16 year old, when you're trying to like figure out like your identity, you know what I mean? You're like, am I a punk? Am I a skater? Am I whatever? And then here's this band that's kind of everything was sort of like, man, they have horns and they're kind of like wearing like glittery shirts on stage, but they're also like, like they'll kick anyone's ass and like, they just like had such a cool vibe that was like, Oh, I don't know if this is like rock and roll or punk or ska or like what is yeah. happening. Yeah, and you I just the- remember that being like such like a cool time to sort of yeah. be in a music. Cause I felt like I, I, at that point, like didn't have to, you know, kind of like align myself with anything. Like I was like, Oh, I can just be into whatever music I want. Cause like, here's a band that's like doing it their own way. And like, everyone's into it. Yeah. No, that's it. Oh, that's cool, man. <laughs> what happened to those guys? They they just stopped on there. They, I don't know. I don't think they're going anymore. As far yeah. as I know. Yeah, I feel like they, I mean, those guys kind of ended up doing the Hot Snakes, mm. which is oh, like okay. a little bit more like straightforwardy kind of like rock and roll. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the, I guess, yeah, that was sort of the the last incarnation. Hot Snakes are still doing stuff now, too, so. Oh. Wow. Uh, what was Speedo's the first? Still in the game. What was the first? Um, um, what was the first uh, gig you played yourself? What was that like? A gig that I played myself. I'm trying to think. I played in like a like a a punk band that I joined um, when I was like 17. Mm. Uh, I was in this like punk band called Another Heather that I got asked to sing. I had always like wanted to play drums. And that was my plan. I was like, okay, I'm going to like get a drum kit. I'm going to like get my chops up and I'm going to learn how to play drums. And then I'm going to, you know, just be the drummer in a band. That was my plan. And then my friend, John, he, we went and saw the band Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. We were like in 1997, we saw like Goldfinger play. And I was like goofing around in between bands. And I was like singing along to like no effects or whatever that they were playing, you know, in the club. And I was like singing this no effects song to like all my friends. And, uh, and my friend John was like, man, you should be a singer in a band. And I was like, Oh, but I want to play drums. Like I'm, I'm a drummer. And he was like, no, my band needs a singer and you can sing. So you should be the singer of my like punk band. Uh, and then that was it. I (laughs) I like never, I joined his band and I was like, Oh, this is actually pretty fun. Although I felt, I don't know why I just like, felt like I wasn't like pulling my weight because I was like I was like in this band that I like didn't write any of the songs I just like wrote the lyrics and I like didn't play an instrument so I just like had a microphone and like showed up but I thought it was like really funny like having like going from like the bulkiest instrument ever to like nothing (laughs) to nothing I was like I can show up to a show on my bicycle (laughs) yeah yeah Oh, it's, it's, you know, guitarist, drummers, I feel for him, man, because that stuff's heavy, right? Yeah, and that's, I always, like, say that I'm still a drummer. I'm a drummer who sings. Uh, I'm not, like, a, a singer who plays drums. Do you, do you drum at home, then? Have you got a drum kit at home? Yeah, I still have a drum kit, and uh, that's, like, still what I use to, like, write songs. Mm. So I'll have, like, ideas that I'll, like, come up with, like, drum parts for, and then that's what I bring to like the rest of the bats guys when we're writing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's really cool, man. I mean, I mean, does, does Mike get gump if you try and tell him drum parts? <laughs> no, no, no. He's down. I mean, we have such like similar, but like different styles. So I feel like now, like I just, you know, kind of like write the like sort of ghost part, you know what I mean? Like the, or like the skeleton of the song. Mm-hmm. And then Mike, Mike will like build on that and make like crazy ideas. But um, when Mike first joined, like all of the, like probably half of the songs on birthing the giant, like Scott and I had already written. Mm. So I was like teaching him those drum parts. And I remember that was when we first like realized that we like played drums like really differently and that we Mm. had to like, kind of like come up with our own language in terms of like how to kind of like, come to like a a similar drumming style but now i feel like we've been playing together for like 15 years so it's it's pretty easy at this point we got a good system 
That's cool. Have you got any have you got anything uh, lined up in the in the pipeline, new music wise? Uh, I mean, other than the like, we've just been working on that acoustic stuff. Yeah, it's cool. Um, yeah. Which, like, though, I think because like we're just sort of reinterpreting songs that we've already written. Yeah. It's a little bit easier because for our band, we really need to be like in the same place. Mm. Like sending demos like over the internet of like new songs. It's kind of like hard, like not, there's no one person in Cancer Bats that like writes, you know, yeah. like Jay will come up with like a lot of riffs and then we'll build on those or all come up with like drum parts and then like a loose kind of like guitar riff idea. Mm. And then everyone will build on those, but like nobody like shows up. We're not one of those bands that like someone like programs drums and like, just like kind of shows the other guys what they're supposed to play. Mm. Uh, we're very much like we kind of all jam together and like, that's how, you know, Scott puts some like squeals on top of stuff and like, you know what I mean? Like that's like kind of the chemistry I, in the same room. And that's how, that's how yeah. it is. Yeah. Very organic. Yeah. So that's more why we were like, Oh, well we can do this acoustic stuff and that's still like fun and entertaining for the time being. Um, mm, and yeah. we are having like a ton of fun with that. Cause again, it's just like, we all know the vibe of the song, you know? So yeah. we're kind of just like all throwing around like ideas on top of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We saw the video um, on, on Instagram and I know you're doing the, the t-shirt for Canadian water aid, aren't you? Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're that, doing like, it's a really nice that thing. thing to kind of like raise some money and do some charity stuff at the same time. Yeah. Um, you know, no, it must be nice to sort of, Know, give something back like that because yeah. obviously you just you're changing up songs and you're, you're releasing t-shirts and you you know you're just you're helping out that's an awesome thing to do especially yeah, in, I mean, in these times you know when everyone's locked down and stuff it's a really good idea mm. yeah and to to kind of like have also like the the like ep itself like have a little bit more meaning than just like us trying to like you know because we're doing it just out of like wanting to entertain people so it's like, yeah, like, let's, like, make some money and put that towards a cause, yeah. you know, right. especially when it, it's not, we're not, like, making anything really that new, <laughs> you know what <laughs> I mean? So it's like, I like the idea of it. Um, I mean, we've been fortunate, like, we definitely have, like, had a career that's, like, allowed us to do, you know, like, some of these charitable things and, like, to work with, like, some some really rad like organizations like helping to raise money for like the you know like the the uh sistering which is like a, a women's shelter in toronto um mm -hmm. i also did like a i did like a head shave for cancer like back in 2016 we were mm -hmm. able to like raise money for like the princess margaret hospital we raised like over twenty thousand dollars for, for cancer that, research that's a lot of money for a head shave. Well, yeah, done, good work. yeah, I was stoked. I mean, it's just nice to be like, I feel like to recognize that we're in like a really privileged and like fortunate position that like, you know, we're not just scraping by anymore. You know, there was like a time when <laughs> man, we didn't have any money at all. And like, we were just like living in the van doing our thing. So for yeah. us at this point, it's like, man, if we can use any of this like position to help others, like that's, that's definitely what like makes us want to like do more things and like continue as a band. Yeah. It's great. It's great to hear the attitude. You know, we, um, we were chatting a couple of weeks ago to uh, James from 18 visions uh, and he was saying oh, a similar cool. thing. And uh, yeah, that, that, he, he's like designed like t-shirt and all this kind of stuff. And with like all the money going to charity, it's so nice to hear people doing things like that these days, you know, it's a bit of positivity in a, in a very dark world at the moment, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, what? Well, and I think it's also it's so rad because you realize, like, literally on like a person by person basis, like no one needs to give a thousand dollars. It's just like it's literally me, like asking each one of our fans for like a buck. Yeah, and, it all adds up, and sure. that's where, and then it's it's like cancer bats as the community, like comes together and raises twenty thousand dollars. But like, mm. no one gave more than like a few dollars to do that. Yeah. It's just, it took me asking everyone to just chip in. And, yeah. and that's kind of like when you, I feel like when you realize like we have these communities and you can communicate to these people, like that's where we can all make such like a huge difference. Mm. And it's not as like daunting of a thing 
Like, man, if you just told someone like you could give like five bucks, you know, and you can help an entire community to like have clean drinking water. Yeah. It's like, Oh, five bucks. Like I have that in my wallet. Like you can have that and it will yeah. not change my life whatsoever. You oh, know, exactly. like, like you said, like we go to chinneries and like, it's like, it's a couple hundred of us like in a room and everyone like kicks in a couple bucks. It's like, Oh man, we all just made a huge difference. And yeah. we have, we all had a great night at the same time. It's like, those are kind of like the moments that I realize, like, Oh, okay, cool. Like we can use this band for like some really positive stuff. And it's mm-hmm. not, you know, going to take a huge toll on anyone. No, that's right. Yeah. And uh, you got your, um, your clothing company, Treadwell, haven't you, Liam? So was that probably oh, easy, yeah. easy for you to knock up a t-shirt then, wasn't it? <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I mean, those are, yeah, those are kind of like the things that I always really love. Like I've always been the the person who's taking care of the merch for the band. So I'm always like, yeah, let's make a shirt. Let's do something new. But uh, yeah, I love like, like being part of like, you know, the art and design of things. And like, I definitely like, that's why I wanted to do the Treadwell stuff even was like just an excuse to make different art, kind of like force myself to do something a little different from like making hardcore t-shirts all the time, just like skulls, yeah. just put a skull on anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of my friends was at the, chin- um, at the Chinneries gig and uh, she said, she didn't know much about you guys, but um, she said that uh, she she was just was chatting to some guy at the merch table, behind the merch table, and then he just got up and started singing. <laughs> she was like, I didn't realize it was the singer. <laughs> yeah, that's my thing. I like, I think maybe kind of like growing up in like punk and hardcore, like you, I really loved that, that like there wasn't any of that, you know, kind of like, like, superstar kind of like fandom you know what i mean that like Mm. i feel like punk and hardcore shows like it was always just like the band doing everything and like hanging out and everyone was really accessible like that's what like got me into the the scene in the first place like i was Mm. like this is so rad like nobody's trying to be like a rock star it's just about like you know playing music you love and like communicating ideas and hanging out and like you watch bands the same way that you're like, they'll watch your band, you know, like all, everyone kind of in a real community together. I thought that was like, that's something to me that I'm like, Oh yeah, I want to hang out. Like sitting backstage awesome. and like just being on Instagram. I'm yeah. like, that sucks. <laughs> like that's not why I came to like England. Like I want to hang out. Yeah, no, totally. It's great to meet people and uh, all that kind of stuff, isn't it? That's, that's part of touring for, you know, a lot, yeah. of, the, a lot of bands um, sort of uh, lose touch with that, you know. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's definitely, like, there's different people. Like, I know not everyone gets into music because they're super outgoing. Like, I know mm. a lot of people, like, learn how to play guitar because they, like, don't want to hang out with anyone. And, yeah. And <laughs> that's also totally cool. But uh, yeah, for me, I just like, I really love like hanging out. I feel so appreciative too, like to, to be at this point that like, we've been coming to England since like 2006, Mm. you know, like there's so many people that have been like supporting our band. It's like, I love like still like, you know, hanging out and like, even just like thanking people for like coming out to the show, you know what Mm. I mean? Cause like, I feel like that side of things you can almost take for granted sometimes that you're just like, pretty nice. You know, like we're all kind of in this together. Because if people mm. stop coming, like we'll like we'll have to just get jobs, and that will suck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard, man. It's hard. But yeah, it's great, you know, because obviously, like you know, your fans come and see the shows, and if they weren't coming, then there wouldn't be anything to do, would there? You know. Yeah, and there wouldn't be a chinneries. You know what I mean? It's like all of those things are like kind of dependent. I mean, that's I feel like part of what I think even having this time with like, you know, the pandemic and everyone kind of like taking a step back from all that. It's like, that's where everybody realizes this kind of like interconnectedness Mm. of everything and how important it all is. And like what, you know, you realize you actually miss when you're like taken away from it. Yeah. Oh, definitely. What's happening with, um, talking about Treadwell again, what have you got planned for next year um, with, with your clothing? Yeah, brand are you, you you making a load of more merch on that yeah i mean keeping it going i 
yeah no it's going really well uh which has actually like been so fortunate like for me like that's entirely what's taken up my time uh while I've like kind of like not been able to tour um so I've been I've been super stoked with that again yeah just like making more I love you know like motorcycling and like that whole scene so just making more kind of like designs like t-shirt wise and then I've got like a new jacket that I'm working on that's gonna hopefully come out like early next year while the weather's still kind of crummy here in Canada (laughs) (laughs) so uh yeah it's definitely really fun to kind of like have something else to like work on and and be creative with so fortunate for me the like motorcycle community I feel like still keeps getting bigger and bigger there's always like new people who are getting into it so it's yeah. definitely a really like fun scene to be a part of as well. Have you have you seen any of like the motocross or any of that in the in the UK? Any motorsport over here? We've got a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, there's such a huge scene. I mean, that was where I kind of was like, uh, it was too bad. Like, I usually come over and like we'll hang out for like last summer. I got to go to the Melly Mile, and like there's a ton of events that like um, happen like around the the flat track scene uh in the uk i was like looking forward to like coming over more um this year because we cancer breaths we were planning on like kind of having a chill year and like um kind of writing a new record and stuff Mm -hmm. like that and then yeah the the like my plan was like oh okay i'm just gonna like do tons of motorcycling and i'm gonna come and like ride bikes around england and like I'll go to some like moto shows in Europe and like, you know, just like really be a part of the scene. And, uh, and mm, mm. Yeah. And that all kind of like, kind of got shut down, but I still, hopefully, I mean, like, I feel like bike shed and all those places have just kind of like pushed a lot of their events. So my hope is to still, yeah, be able to like pick up some of that stuff next year and uh and be a part of it because yeah the moto scene is so great i used to come over i don't know if you guys uh ever went to like dirt dirt quake it used to happen in like king's lynn but it was like sideburn magazine used to put on this like flat track event called dirt quake Mm. and uh it was super fun like people would put on costumes and like kind of like race all sorts of like wacky bikes um but yeah i feel like that that kind of vibe I was hoping for more of those kind of events to happen, but you, who knows, hopefully. Have you ever heard of uh, Santa Pod, a, a drag strip over in England, in Northampton? No. No. I know um, drag racing and top fuel and all that's massive in America, isn't it? Top fuel drag Yeah, strip. there's definitely a crazy, that's a whole world of like motorsport that I don't know a ton about. Oh, but... Right, yeah, because they have like, top, I was going to say, I wonder if you'd ever seen top fuel bikes. Um because I mean, these bike, you know, these top fuel cars are doing like four second quarter of a mile, and then you've got top fuel bikes four or five seconds. That's one that you ever caught one of them live. Because that is that's ground shaking that stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I grew up on a, on a drag strip. I love going to any of that stuff. I think it's so fun to watch. Yeah, especially when you get the night when you do the night racing, top fuel night racing on the bikes, and oh my god, insanity. Yeah, no, yeah, it's, it's crazy. It looks so easy, too, when you see guys just, like, take off and, like, clear it. But then every once in a while, somebody has, like, a big crash. And you're like, oh, yeah, this is actually, like, super hard. <laughs> <laughs> and very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's super dangerous. So uh, moving back to uh, Cancer Bats, when you started, did you ever think you'd have six studio albums, Liam? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, that's, you? Done pretty well. it's, it's such a crazy trip to think about because like nobody starts a hardcore band uh even thinking that they're gonna put out you know like two records let alone six like it feels crazy and i think that's kind of the neat thing about hardcore like in how it's just like evolving um i mean the, the idea that we're all like playing in these bands and putting out you know six and seven albums and like bands that we've been touring with you know like like combat kid is like still putting out records. Like we Mm. said, the Bronx, like the Bronx is still putting out like awesome records and everybody's in these like points where they're like kind of redefining, you know, what their band is like, you know, like I look at a band, like every time I die, like I was going to see them when I was like 20 years old 
yeah. like moshing in the crowd and then like you know fast forward we're like playing festivals and stuff together and yeah, it's yeah. like man those guys are yeah like they're putting out like a new record or just dropped two songs that are like so sick you know, yeah, they're, like they're some of the awesome, aren't they? I can't believe how good they are. Well, I can believe how good they are. I mean, they <laughs> yeah, just keep, and they that, that's, I strength. think, kind of like the, the cool side of it because you're used to like bands like who sort of get to a point in their career and you're like, I don't know, like, you know, you don't want like album eight of like anyone, but now that like bands like Converge and like Every Time I Die and like all these like cool artists are like still pushing it and still making you know, music that's like aggressive and chaotic and like mm. inspiring. I think that side of things is so cool. Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, we went eight studio albums. Yeah, yeah, keep them coming. Keep them coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, and I think that's the thing too is that like for us, it's where we also like don't want to be like rushing anything. Like I think we have such like a a great, you know, like um kind of like track record it's like i don't want to like you know dive into like especially like in this kind of case like where we can't be in the same room together it's like i'd rather like take our time you know and make a record that like surpasses what we did with the spark that moves and not Mm -hmm. something that just like you know is an excuse to go back on tour and i think that's like kind of for us the most important thing yeah but, you know, you guys, you know, from, from looking in from the outside, you guys always seem to have something to laugh together, that kind of stuff. You know, you got the you got the Bat Sabbath stuff going on, all that. It just looks like so much fun. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's the other side, too, is that, like, we genuinely, like, are still touring and playing music because we love it. Yeah. I, and that's, like, a really important thing for us. Like, we kind of always talk, like, if if anyone in the band is, like, not feeling it, like mm. kind of like you know there's no beef like it's it's definitely like something that we all want to be like yeah a hundred percent into and, and in a way like that's kind of where when like guys were having kids we were like dude like be a dad mm. you know what i mean like take the time to like be with your with your kid and with your wife and like your family and like we'll go and rip these shows because we have like you know there's lots of people who know how to play drums and guitar and like want to bring that energy i never want anyone to feel like they you know are like leaving their family or like missing out on an obligation to yeah. just like play a show you know what i mean because yeah. then that takes away from like the experience you should be having on stage yeah that's it you know i mean you know there's a lot of people out there who uh, like big musicians who obviously you know massive musicians who barely see their families like when they can tour and but that's that's their bread and butter isn't it that's that's that is yeah their oh, so, and th- there's there's tons of sacrifice that comes along with it like yeah. even when you know we're you know we're on tour like i know that like scott and mike like they both miss their kids like crazy mm. you know and i mm. see how like tough that is like when we're in australia and like the time change is like so bonkers you know and you're trying to like facetime your kids yeah i'm like oh i totally see where that's like such a you know such a real thing Mm. but at the same time it's like we're also you know in australia or in these places to like to like you know put on a good show and to like make sure we have you know like a good vibe so i always want everyone to just be stoked yeah it's so cool that like you've got fans around the world and you can go and visit these places you know it's uh, yeah it's a privilege right it's you know it's really cool Yeah, and I always want to, like, make sure, you know, like, there's nothing worse than, like, seeing a band that's not into it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, you're used to seeing, like, some hardcore bands, like, go crazy. And you can tell sometimes when they're just, like, hanging out, like, they're just going through the motions. Yeah. And you're like, ah, this sucks. Like, I didn't need to see this. Or, like, maybe not just hardcore bands. Like, I've definitely seen some shows that was like, oh, okay, I don't need to see that band anymore. Mm. You know, and it's like, well, I never like as a fan, I never want to like give somebody that feeling like I mm. want like them to be like, yes, I just went to this cancer ed show. It was like just as good as what I was like 15 years old. Like, you know, that's the vibe. It, I want it everyone is. To walk it is away Believe me, it is. I, yeah. we, I saw your first download show and I also saw your um, Sonosphere show. Um, and then, like I say, we saw you again last year. And you're just as good. So that's, 
That's basically yeah. it. That's, <laughs> it. That's it, isn't it, really? Yeah. yeah. I think, yeah, yeah, three times I've seen it. And it's been great Although, every single time. I definitely don't stage dive as much as I used to. I remember <laughs> at Sonosphere. I don't blame you. I was like, I was like stage diving like nonstop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah my, I, yeah, my friend's got some uh, videos and photos of that. I actually texted him today saying, you've got to find them. They're on his hard drive. You've got to find those photos and videos. Yeah. <laughs> and Dude, I remember when, the when last I, when year. When I do, I'm gonna, I'll put them up. So, the yeah. last year that we played <laughs> that we played Sonosphere, I was like stage diving like nonstop. And on the last song, we were doing Hail Destroyer in the, the crowd. They stole both my shoes. <laughs> And I was, like, standing at the barricade, like, after the set. And I was, like, just, like, taking some photos with kids. And I was, like, in just, like, my socks. Like, standing in the mud. And I was, like, this is sick. <laughs> you didn't get them back? Oh, no. They are long gone. Someone <laughs> out there. That, some that, was, that, was, um, that was crazy. That was, like, in a, in a tent, wasn't it? It was absolutely Yeah. That mental. was the same year that we, did, uh, that we did the Bat Sabbath as, like, the surprise set. Yeah, it was like the Sunday. That we played awesome, in the afternoon at like five o'clock, and then after Slipknot, That's like right. the lat, like after Slipknot, then we played the Bad Sabbath set in yeah. the same tent. You, S- such you a good set, set yeah, you, such you a good set, set. Hobo, yeah. I loved it, but do you know what? I was in that karaoke tent. <laughs> you Were you? To, yeah, you can't yeah. believe this guy. That was unbelievable. That's even that bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be fair, it was it was definitely unannounced. Like that, we just that's where we came up with the idea of Bat Sabbath because they were like, "Oh, we can't say that it's like Cancer Bats playing a Sabbath set. You got to tell them, or we'll make up a name." And so we mm. didn't even think about it. We were like, "Oh, just put put Bat Sabbath on it. <laughs> That'll be you know, funny." You know what you need but to do I that. thought everyone would kind of know. Like everyone would like in my brain. <laughs> I was like, "Oh yeah, Bat Sabbath." Cancer yeah. Bats are playing. Well, but like, not... man, people people were like like asking us if we knew who the secret band was. <laughs> <laughs> I knew. I don't know how I knew, but I mean, I was in that tent to watch it, so he was there. Yeah, you way. put two and two together, or you were just a true Sabbath fan. I feel yeah, like maybe. that was the thing. Like, most people just saw Sabbath and were like, fuck it, who cares? Like, whoever's, yeah. whoever's playing Sabbath, I'm here for it. <laughs> Yeah, I think you should, you guys need to go out and do do a tour with uh, Zach Sabbath. How would you feel about that? I mean, yeah, I a lot of people have brought that up. I'd be so down for it. Yeah, we, we, we played a <laughs> we played a festival with Black Label Society yeah. in in Norway like a bunch of years ago, and we mm. did a we did a Sabbath song to like close out our set, and this was before the Zach Sabbath thing was going. Mm. But, uh, man, like, uh, the whole band and crew were, like, standing side stage because they were playing after us. But yeah. uh, they were all, like, you know, like, we played Into the Void, and they were all standing around, like, rocking out, like, like super into it. And we ended up all hanging out, and I was like, oh, man, we should do, like, a, like a Sabbath, you know, like, a Bad Sabbath, like, Black Label Society tour would be sick. That would be well uh, but yeah, that I mean, obviously that never happened. But uh, yeah, I'd be so down. I think it would be so fun too because you could also like kind of like pick and choose like different songs. Like I, I feel like we do enough songs that are different from the like Zach Sabbath set that it's like, oh, you could have then like almost like two full sets then of like six Sabbath songs. Yeah. And, like, both of our versions are, like, different enough that I think it would – I don't know. I think it would be fucking sick. But, <laughs> I reckon it would be, mate. I'd be, I'd be be you. Paper, you got I don't know who you got to – like, <laughs> you guys – you got to get – uh, you got to get Zach Wild on your podcast and bring it up with him. I feel like it's more his call than mine. Uh, I've messaged him. I've messaged his wife, but no. No reply. <laughs> <laughs> so far, no go. What can you do? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. The life of everyone a on that podcast, man. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me. Yeah, it's great fun. No, it's, it's it's good fun to do. It's great chatting to you guys as well. You know, it's uh, it's nice. Who would you like yeah, to? Yeah, uh... it's cool. I mean, I definitely, uh, I definitely think it's it's rad that like lots of this stuff is happening. Like now, obviously, the internet makes it super easy. Mm. You guys can just like record a little hang and then. <laughs> chuck it up on the internet yeah see, as i say i mean the podcast thing's becoming like it's sort of 
grown so much in like the last year. It's uh, massive, isn't it? It's just I've never even had any idea how big it was. But you know, you know me, I wasn't. Uh, uh, <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's, you know, there's a there's a podcast on anything you can ever think of. Which I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had no idea until I was on Instagram. I was like, oh my god, podcast of Instagram. And yeah. Like, Millions. Yeah. <laughs> I was gobsmacked. Yeah, I was listening to one the other day about crop rotation in the 16th century. It was, uh, it was, yeah, it was riveting. <laughs> so, um, we've mentioned that world and stuff. Um, who would you like to collaborate with, Liam, if anyone, maybe on a future Pants Bats album? Um, I don't know. I feel like we've uh, we've definitely we've definitely been fortunate to have like a ton of cool guests. Yeah. Um. Like so far, yeah. I don't know. I always feel like it kind of like is the vibe. Like as we're, you know, kind of like working on the tracks, it never comes to us until sort of like the song itself like takes shape. Like, I feel like, you know, like, even asking, like, Tim from Rise Against and, like, Ben from Billy Talent, it's, like, those dudes, like, it made sense to have them be a part of those songs because it was, like, you know, we were on tour, like, working on those records and, like, obviously, like, having Wade on it, like, makes sense and, like, Mm. I don't know, I feel like it, it kind of, like, it's usually once the song takes shape, it, it then, like, speaks to who it, it should you know like be i mean i have tons of like homies that i'd love to have on on like you know records like andrew from comeback kid and like number two from anti-flag and like all the homies but i I feel like it's like it's not until the song kind of like takes shape that i'm like oh yeah we should you know i should ask des from like you know like um from you know, Cole Chambers sing on this, like, that would be a vibe, like, Des is the homie, and, like, it's, like, stuff like that that, like, makes sense, you know what I mean? So, mm. I feel I feel like it's, like, almost, uh, it's, like, more like the the chicken needs to come before the egg, or yeah. maybe vice versa, <laughs> like, yeah, mm. when, when, like, the vibe is there, you're, like, oh, yeah, this is, like, such a good idea, I should ask this person, but I will say that, like, the main thing, like, when any of us think about like a guest like for us it's always got to be somebody that we have a connection to yeah like that we're friends with and that like we you know like already make sense like I definitely like never want to just like ask someone that doesn't already have a connection to the band Mm. I always think like that was you know back in the day like there was like bands that would like get Lemmy from Motorhead to sing on it and it was like they just like paid him money to like sing on their track yeah and I'm like I guess that's cool because it's Lemmy, but like at the same time, like he doesn't know who your fucking band is. Like uh, uh, it doesn't like it's just like he's not your friend. He just like sent you this like track. I think of that stuff like all the time, where it's just like ah, I don't want to just be like using somebody's like you know notoriety or clout. Yeah. Like I want it to be because they make sense as the person in this song. You know, mm. you're not gonna ring up Miley Cyrus anytime soon, then. Or like I would be so into Miley Cyrus if there was like if we were friends, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I, you know, like that's the kind of vibe where I'm like, oh, yeah. I'd rather ask like my friend Hannah from Manchester who like gets up on stage and sings with us all the time because she's awesome. Like mm. that's who I want to have sing on the next record. Versus yeah, like paying Miley Cyrus to, like <laughs> to like scream on it because like that'll help out our band. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, you want to keep the family, you know, the tight connection, and it's, you've got to feel it. You're part of your crew. Do it on the record. Yeah. Totally. It's got to, it's, yeah, it's got to feel right, isn't it, at the end of the day? You know. But like, oh, my yeah. God. Talking of feeling right, have you <laughs> – this is, this is so – I've gone so off tangent here. But have you heard the new single by David Hasselhoff? No. <laughs> this is a It's fan. metal. He's done a metal song with some guy. It's like proper riffage with him shouting over the top of it. And there's a, the, <laughs> the videos out there and everything. And it was released a couple of days ago, but check it out, man. You've got to see it to believe it. I'm gonna yeah. Go after oh, this man, I'll, I'll check that out for sure. <laughs> so I, grew up with, I grew up watching Baywatch. I know what's up. <laughs> Mate, I must be older than you because I, I grew up watching Knight Rider. <laughs> oh, yeah. I remember Knight Rider. 
<laughs> I was definitely a, I was definitely a young kid watching Night Rider. Yeah. Yeah, man. Oh, what a program. I've been a fan of his forever and I'm, I just can't believe he's done a metal song, not serious metal. It's like, oh my God, where did that come from? And I saw him in the pantomime. So I said, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it was, it was, he played book. We're going off, we're going off tangent. Yes, yeah, so I just had to get that in there about the half, man. I'd, you know, I know you're going to watch it now and I'm pleased. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm going to, I'm going to check that out for sure. Definitely got to check all the vibes. Yeah, man. <laughs> What's your favourite Christmas song? <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Favourite Christmas favorite. song? I mean, I definitely love White Christmas, like the yeah. movie. Cool. Oh. Any of the jams off that, but White Christmas, the the song, I feel like is a is a banger. Yeah. Um, but I grew up like my mom was always like super into musicals and stuff like that, so we would watch White Christmas like every year at Christmas time. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it's a wonderful so good. life, all that. Yeah, less wonderful life is okay. I feel like, yeah, more white Christmas for sure for the win. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's nice. National Lampoon's Christmas Day. Oh, no, that's that's the ultimate, isn't it? With yeah, the, that one's great too. When he was yeah, you gotta you gotta do all the you know, you gotta watch Die Hard, you gotta watch Elf, you gotta watch yeah. White Christmas. So, you, so, so you're saying Die Hard is a Christmas film. Yeah, it takes place. Let's just that up. <laughs> <laughs> it is a Christmas film. Of course, it's a Christmas film. One and two, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, of course. You know, so many people say they're not they're not Christmas films, but it's rubbish. Of course, no, it's a film. I actually, yeah, I'm gonna put that on my list. I definitely have to watch them again. Uh, we, I watched, yeah, you gotta watch that. The other night, so I wanted to get in the spirit. It's it's not Christmas until Hans falls out that window, man. Then you know it's Christmas. <laughs> Yeah, at least also, too, I feel like has a little bit more, like, snow. Yeah, that's true. Well. So, like, Die Hard 2 definitely feels yeah, more Christmassy to me. That's the airport one, right? Yeah. Just, yeah. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. brilliant films. Yeah. Oh, they're, yeah. They're all good films. They're all good films. Are you, like, massively into your films and that, then? You like all that? Yeah, I definitely like checking out checking out movies. Mm. Um, I feel I'll... like this year I, like, haven't been to a movie theater no, no. Which is weird, like, to think about. I usually like going to see movies and, like, going to, like, the the actual, like, movie theater. But, yeah. yeah, it's weird to think about that, too. Like, not going to see a show, not going to see a movie, just sitting at home watching it on a laptop. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Uh, yeah. yeah, Liam, I was going to ask you, um, you, you, you covered Sabotage, and it's – Brutal version of it. I absolutely <laughs> love it. I actually love the, the guitar solo in it. It just it just goes off crazy, doesn't it? I, I love I love that that version of it. But out of all the Beastie Boys songs, why was it that one that you chose? And did at least two questions at once actually. So you have to bear <laughs> with me. Did the Beastie Boys ever give you any feedback on it? Did they like it? Do you know? Um. Well, the Beast Boys have never, like, reached out, but uh, they definitely have, like, never, like, told us not to do it or, like, sued us. So I feel like oh, it's got to be cool. Like it. Yeah, at this point, or at least they tolerate it. Um, but for me, like, coming up with that, uh, with that, like, cover was we did, like, a bunch of covers. Like, we covered, like, a bunch of other songs, like Murder City Devils. We did, like, a faint cover. We did like a bunch of songs and nobody ever knew what the cover was. Like we would play it and like people would kind of like stand still and like, just like scratch their heads. And I was like, well, this isn't like, you know, any fun. Like we're just like kind of playing really obscure songs. So that was like, I was like, man, we need to cover a song that like everyone knows. Like it doesn't matter like who you are, like, you know, this song. And that was, like, my thinking was, like, oh, let's cover, like, Sabotage, because also it, like, makes sense. Like, it's, like, a heavier kind of song. Um, so, yeah, that was my thinking with it. And yeah, I also was, yeah. like, I knew a lot of people that covered, like, Fight for Your Right to Party. So I was, like, oh, I don't want to do that one. But that song goes over really well. Like, it's, like, super heavy and, like, kind of, like, you know, works in, like, a hardcore context. So I was like, oh, we should cover Sabotage, and then that will, you know, like, kind of be the same vibe. Did you have fun doing the video? It looked like fun. 
Yeah, the, well, and that was our other side too, was like, I feel like the Beastie Boys have such amazing music videos that even though we're not really like changing the song that much, like I still wanted to do something that was like creative mm. uh, and like fun in the same like vibe as like their videos. So that was kind of the whole thinking behind it was to like make something that would be to the same caliber of like a Beastie Boys video mm. um, since we're like kind of in that same world. So that was like our, our at least like our creative outlet with the whole project but i've heard that they've even seen the video that like somebody told me i can't remember it was like a friend of a friend was like oh yeah they've like seen the video and they like know about it but like i've never yeah like ad rocks never called me up or like oh. told me that he's down but vice versa <laughs> like, I'm, he's never like talked shit so <laughs> i mean I, I i think no it's like the uh it's like it's like showing your influences, showing like what a, a song that you love. You know, I mean, you know, I think you know, yeah, if I mean, they, anything they've got to take it as a compliment. Yeah, they sample all their heroes on their tracks, yeah. don't they? Yeah, and I think, so that's the thing. I think they totally. You know. And they came from like the New York City hardcore scene too, so I feel like those dudes they get it. They're cool. They're like mm. my favorite band, so I I hope they're cool. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, that was, I was that was going to be one of my questions. Like, who's your favorite band? And they are your favorite band. band. <laughs> oh yeah beastie boys like i've been a massive beastie boys fan like my whole life excellent i think that i actually saw them at brixton academy and uh, we you never know what you're going to get whether they're going to come out and, and rap with the microphones or that the band's going to come out and it was just a full band the whole gig just smashing it out mm. yeah when i saw 2007 them in, yeah uh, i saw them in 1999 on the hello nasty tour mm. and uh yeah, it was like full band. Oh, um, it was the best. It was like the best show I've ever been to in my life. Wow, that's quite an accolade. Yeah, it was an amazing gig, actually. Yeah, it was like like, album, like that's when you see when you see like superstar kind of like performers. Mm. Like there's people who are like, oh yeah, I wonder, you know, like people are into that band. It's like when you watch like the Beastie Boys play, it's like they put on such like an incredible show and they're like such like not like, I felt like that show was like two and a half hours long and mm. like nobody stopped dancing. Like we were all just like partying like crazy the whole time. And it's like, well, yeah, that's why you guys are like, that's why there's 60,000 people watching this show. Yeah. I and mean, that's what the show's about, isn't it? It's, you know, and then uh, mixed master Mike comes out for about 10 minutes before they come on, doesn't he? And that, that bit was awesome as well. <laughs> it was just, Oh, all of it. Like it just whole, did the whole ten minutes of cutting and scratching and that before they even come out and the band comes out. Yeah, it was just a killer shot. Yeah, and everyone they play with is like incredible. Like, yeah, it's such a cool such a cool vibe. Mm. Yeah, man. We miss gigs. So. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god. We really miss we just end up constantly talking about gigs we've been to and that's the point of the podcast, but it's just probably why it's just because we've been to it's hard you're so, like thinking about gigs yeah so uh so what's your favorite album of all time then is it the beastie boys album uh yeah like beastie boys what you want was definitely is like a huge record for me mm. um when i was growing up too like i was a massive led zeppelin fan mm -hmm. i feel like led zeppelin 3 is also that same kind of vibe like i'm like oh this is like you know, like a band like at the height of their game who were able yeah. to like keep it going. You know what I mean? Like I think of like Beastie Boys, like putting out like what you want and then like ill communication and then hell no nasty. It's like, you're putting out all of these like crazy records, like back to back to back. Mm. It's like same with like, you know, you think about like Led Zeppelin putting out like Led Zeppelin three and then like, just like keeping it up. You know what I mean? Like every record that they're putting out is like, different and amazing and like killing it like i guess like that, that kind of like going back to what we were talking about like the idea of like bands putting out like six and seven records it's like that's so foreign until you start thinking of these like huge like kind of like acts that were able to be that prolific mm. like i think that's the the thing is that like as accessible as we all are to like 
you know, going to a studio and making music. It's like, until you have that much to say, it's like, you're, you're not going to be able to like keep putting out these like crazy records. And it's only like a few people I think that are in these like positions that are able to make, you know, like records that are always at this huge caliber. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. It's that ACDC. They're just putting other out, Matt, and they stick with their same formula. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone loves it. Yeah, it doesn't mean totally (laughs) works for them, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, and I think that's sometimes where, like, artists get lost, because you kind of, like, stop thinking of your band as, like, what, like, you know, you're, like, wondering what you should do to stay relevant, but at the same time, you're like, I don't want this band to be relevant. Like, I don't mm. want ACDC to, you know, put out, like, a trap album. I want ACDC to put out, like, an ACDC record. Mm. Same with, like, Metallica. Like, I feel like Metallica keeps, like, wanting to, like, put out these, like, relevant records. And it's like, no, I just want to hear, like, Master of Puppets. Yeah. yeah. Like, I just want to hear Injustice for All. Like, yeah. I get where you guys can, like, do different things, and that's cool. But, yeah. like where you were really nailing it was when you were just like, you know, like redefining what you were already killing it. Yeah. I think that's like some of the stuff that we like, that we get like a little bit lost in. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's like, um, it's like seeing the reviews. I mean, it might not be your thing, but like the, the new Smashing Pumpkins album, it's like, they're not getting any good feedback whatsoever. They've released a double album. It's like this little, 80s sort of goth-tinged electronic album, and it's amazing, but the press is getting is just dire. It's, you know, no one's understanding why they've done it. But you like it? I really like it, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, each to their own, you know, but everyone's like, why has he done that? You know, why, why have they done that? It's just weird, but it sounds like... Yeah, I, have, I mean, me. Smashing Pumpkins are definitely a, a band that's, like, always, you know, continued to, like, kind of change and, like, put out like different kinds of you know albums i guess mm. there's different ways of looking at it too because like yeah maybe it's also like with heavy music you're like man i just want this to sound like brutal <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i can yeah. listen to radiohead and like hear you know a band evolve and like do crazy things it's like mm. i also just want a band to like sound brutal and like I just want every Lamb of God record to sound the same. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I just want it to sound like Lamb of God. If a, if a band does something so well, then why mix it up? <laughs> yeah, that's sometimes what I think. And, like, even when we're writing, like, records now, like, the way I always, like, think about it is, like, what do Cancer Bats fans, like, want to hear? Like, the guy who has, like, you know, the bat skull tattooed on the back of his hand – like, what does he want to hear when he's, like, pitting, you mm. know? Like, that's, like, the, the like, input that I'm always thinking about. Yeah. And, like, I think where we kind of, like, were able to, like, capture that mindset, like, with the last record, I was, like, really stoked because it was just, like, yeah, like, us getting excited in the same way that, you know, we did, like, back when we wrote, you know, Hail Destroyer. Mm. It's, like yeah, we're trying out some ideas and we're playing around with some stuff, but at the same time, I want it to sound like Cancer Bats. I yeah. don't want it to sound like, you know, whatever. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, you stick to your roots, man. I mean, you've got six very successful, great albums. And, you know, why mix it up too much? You know, you've got your own sound. you found your own sound after many years, and uh, that's what it's about, isn't it? Yeah. And I think in a lot of ways, what we're just trying to do is like fix all of our past mistakes. <laughs> now that we're like better players, we're like, okay, we could just like kind of like finish some of those ideas that we started, you know, on, you know, Bears, Mares, Grab Some Bones, or like some of the stuff like on DSOL, where like maybe we didn't have enough time to kind of like fully figure out some of these ideas. Mm. And it's like now that we're like better players and like better songwriters, it's like, we can kind of go back and like do a better version of some of those like songs that we started. Fair point. Yeah. What's the, uh, what, out, out of your albums, what's the one you're most proud of or what's the one you had like the most fun recording? Um, I don't know. That one I have to pause for cause I, <laughs> I like personally, I don't love recording. Mm. like i that's not like my i i'm way more into touring 
Yeah. And I love like going on tour and like playing songs. I mean, for me, I really think like I loved like the challenge that was writing Dead Set on Living. Mm -hmm. Like for me, I was like, okay, we like kind of wrote some good songs on like Bears. And I think like on Hail Destroyer, we like, we like had a, a lot of fun, but we didn't really know what we were doing. Like, I feel like we wrote a really good record, like by default, just by like pouring ourselves into it. Mm. So by the time we got to like Dead Set on Living, we were like, okay, we need to write another good record. And that was where we actually like, I feel like stepped up as like songwriters and like really tried to like push through and like refine the songs to make sure they were good and not mm -hmm. just like throw them out and kind of be like, well, I hope people like this. Like I was like, no, I know that Bricks and Mortar is like a kick-ass song because we just spent like six months like making sure it was kick-ass. Yeah. And that, that was kind of like where I like really felt like we had figured out, you know, like some of those like, like things. I still feel like we ran out of time with like Dead Stone Living. And I've, I feel like any band that's like full time, like you just don't have as much time as you want. Like mm. when you're, you're trying to fit into like a touring cycle and when you're trying to like continue, like, you know, pushing your career, it's like, you can't spend all the time that you want in the studio because you don't have that much money and you don't have that much time. And so you, some of those songs, you just have to kind of say like, okay, this is it. Like, this is as good as it gets. But I feel like that record was like, was us kind of like stepping up to like another level and being like, okay, we're going to like, you know, like I'm going to have all these lyrics finished, like before we go in the studio and like, we're going to jam this to a click, like, so we can record it live. And like, there was just like a lot of those ideas that we like really stepped up to mm -hmm. on that album that I felt like really proud of. Oh, that's the one. Then. That's, you made the most of that time you had for the album then you really put, put everything into it concentration wise. Yeah, yeah and kind of like we yeah. we had to have a song that like lived up to like where the sabotage cover had kind of put our band like i felt like that was like a very real thing that we like put out hail destroyer and lucifer's rocking chair and everyone like really vibed on that and then we put out sabotage and that kind of like surpassed any of the songs that were on bears mares i i still think that record's like sick and I think there's a lot of like really great songs that are on it, but I felt like the sabotage like raised the bar for like what level our band was at. Mm -hmm. And then that was like where I was kind of like, okay, we have to like now meet this new standard that like sabotage kind of pushed us up to that. Like, you know, like we, we were sort of like, you know, making our way there. And then all of a sudden, like, yeah, like we jumped up a level. And I was like, okay, now like we, we shouldn't make it look like that was a fluke, mm -hmm. you know, like we should really like be able to capitalize on this. And I, I thought like with, okay, yeah, we wrote like rats and like bricks and mortar. And like, we had real songs on that record yeah. that I felt like we're at that same kind of like level that like, okay, I can play these in a set next to sabotage and it doesn't get blown away by this one song that we didn't even write you know mm. what i mean we just like kind of yeah. worked it into our own set Where yeah, in a way a, a cover song it made you you sort of strive to to you know better the power of the, of the music in a way which is yeah pretty cool really isn't it another person's bit of music made you feel like you had to try even harder yeah oh, oh. totally and i think oh. like also in that meantime we were like learning a lot like in doing the like the bat sabbath stuff like that also happened in between like us like putting out uh bears and then, like writing dead sun on living like that was like a huge transition too because you kind of like it's like learning from the masters mm -hmm. like in like doing all those covers we were just like oh this is also a completely different way of writing like superstar level songs Mm, mm. you know and like really kind of like dialing into that and like trying to just like learn how to play those songs like i yeah. feel like black sabbath is like amazing in that like 
all the songs sound really easy until you like try and learn how to play them. Yeah. And you realize they're all super complex and like there's a ton of like crazy jazz and like everybody's playing off of each other in this like really crazy way that just comes off as like super simple. Mm. But you realize that that's why those songs are like so important. Yeah. yeah. So the structure of Black Sabbath songs actually helped you as well. The, the, the structure of those songs. So. Yeah. And like just learning like different like song styles. Cause like, a lot of hardcore is always just, you know, the same, same, same kind of like song patterns. And then you look at something like, man, the, between like a song like Into the Void that just has like a huge intro and yeah. like doesn't give a shit. Like, yeah, this is like its own vibe and like can be its own thing. And then, you know, like a song like Children of the Grave that like has like it's there's no real chorus it just has these like super catchy riffs that like kind of like cycle through this whole thing mm. you're like oh these guys like kind of were on their own separate tip when it came to like like with like tony and geezer writing these songs like it was just like very much like their own free thinking yeah amazing absolutely amazing no and i wanted to ask you what's the Weirdest gig you've ever played, Jim. I think just play some weirdest, the weirdest, the weirdest, weirdest gig. gig. Yeah. We've asked I that remember, before. On this. I remember we used to we used to think that like cancer bats we could play in front of anybody and it like really didn't matter. Like we were just like put us in front of any crowd, like in this like kind of cocky way. We were just like, we'll do whatever. And I remember my friend was tour managing Lacuna Coil. And they had a band that like, I forget what happened. They'd like dropped out there that somebody had gotten hurt and like, couldn't play their uh, show at the forum. Mm. And we were just flying over from Canada and we landed at Heathrow and my phone rang and it was my friend who was like tour managing Lacuna Coil. And he was like, dude, are you guys in England? And I was like, we just got to the airport. And he's like, do you want to play with Lakuta Coil tonight? And I was like, yes. <laughs> and so he was like, I'll give you 500 pounds. Like, come on down. So we like picked up our gear. We went straight to the forum and like met every, like everyone in Lakuna Coil is like so rad. And like, we were all hanging out. We're like, this is going to be the sickest. And like, we got on stage and it was like, man, we like, we're ripping through our set and it was like crickets. It was like really? the, the like forum was packed full of Lacuna Coil fans and they did not give a shit about our band. <laughs> and I remember like we got off stage and like all the like the dudes like from Lacuna Coil, like the guitar players were all like, oh, that was sick. And I was like, man, I'm glad you guys thought so. Cause like <laughs> this was like playing to like just like a totally different crowd. And that was when it, it kind of like this was like early days of Bat. So we were probably only like touring on hail destroyer like we we're like very much just a hardcore band you know mm. and i was just like oh, okay like we can't play in front of any crowd it's like we can play in front of like any punk crowd we yeah. can play in front of any hardcore crowd but like we can't open up a lacuna coil tour <laughs> <laughs> you know that now don't you <laughs> yeah it was a really great lesson well, but it's also yeah. fun too because like i think you realize in those like times when you're like oh yeah but at the end of the day like it was still fun you know what i mean like it was still like a great show and like like i said like those the people in the kuna coil were so cool and like everyone was like hanging out and having fun yeah. it was just like even at like the weirdest kind of situation it's like yeah but we're still like having fun and playing music yeah. and like, it's still worth it and plus, yeah, you know, exactly. I, I bet, Two I bet thousand like people weren't into it but like the five or six you know, Lakuna Coil and their crew, as long as they had a good time. <laughs> I bet there was at least five or ten people in the audience who went and bought the album the next day, though, you know? Yeah, oh, totally. And that's kind of, like, the thing. I've definitely, like, met some people, like, down the, down the road that have, like, you know, who were at that Lacuna Coil show. Yeah. But it's hard to, it's hard to hear the, like, one person at the back being like, woohoo! <laughs> 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 you know, and it's, like, a pretty, like, 2,000 people not vibing. <laughs> maybe uh, even maybe even if it's like 1,500 people that like don't care. And there's like 
even 500, but they're spread out in every corner. You're kind of like, oh, I get my, I get the drift. Well, I mean, the worst thing could have been if there was just like one guy doing a slow hand clap, you know? Yeah, I feel like everyone was like kind of polite. Like it, it's sort of like the perfect Damn. scenario. We've never <laughs> like played that many shows, you know, that are that harsh. No, like when no, you think about it. Yeah, like it could have been like 2,000 people throwing bottles at us. So mm. could have been way worse. But yeah, that, that's the one then, the, the, the kid Porgy. That was the one. What about, um, say, you must have played. Have you played in Halifax where, where you actually live at the moment? Have you played? Have the Kansas Bats played there? Yeah, yeah. We just played uh, last end of last year. All right. So you, you, the difference between playing there and then, say, playing... In London, what what what, are you, what is the crowd difference like? Is it the same or is it is the vibe different? Uh, I mean, Best vibe is the vibe is the same. I mean, this like where I live, there's less than a million people. Um, so it's like the show. Like we had like an amazing show when we played here. There was like 700 people. You know, the vibe is like is crazy. That's the one thing that I think is like unique for like you know like a hardcore band is that there there is something to be said about that universal language of like a hardcore show like it's like when we play in london it's like yeah maybe there's like twice as many people but it's like but the vibe is still like you're at a hardcore show you Mm -hmm. know and people are like going off and singing along and, and you can feel that energy you know what i mean like regardless if it's like 200 people and you're in like a packed club it's like that chaos is is going to translate you know it doesn't mm. it to me it, it's like one of the things that i think is so cool about being in this community is that like yeah we play like a show like we play like a hometown show in toronto and like like having a huge crowd like having a thousand people like go nuts like is amazing but at the same time when you play like a small town and you know their whole hardcore community is there like with you like mm. it's just like it doesn't matter really how many people are there like when there's just like that much energy in a room yeah. and it's full it just like it translates into such like a an awesome experience yeah oh definitely yeah i mean at the end of the day that they, you're there to see the cancer bats it's going to be the same <laughs> yeah well of course yeah yeah, That's like a pack of Henry's gig, you know, like that. There's something that feels like a hometown show whenever it's like a, a really like packed out good vibe. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm shocked to hear you played there three or four times. Yeah, I only knew about the last one. We didn't go, but the only reason we didn't go is because we were going to download it. We, we knew we were going to see it. We knew we were going to see it then. <laughs> we were saving, saving our beer fund for, for the festivals. <laughs> True, we blew it. Well, next time we'll play Chinneries and we'll make sure we're not doing any other gigs. Yeah, man, that'd be wicked. And you and you bring in uh, Zach Wild there as well, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, so it's <laughs> coming. It'll be wicked. So cool. Um, <laughs> I know you've got a lot of um, fans. You know, I saw you go online on Insta the other night, Liam, and all your fans are on there. And great little chat. You're going to do it again, aren't you? Um, yeah, we're going to try and do those weekly, I think. Yeah, it's a good little insight. You know, just you've given an update and talking to them. They, they absolutely loved it, didn't they? Um, yeah, it was fun. In these tough times that we're all going through at the moment, what would be your one message to your fans um, with regards to, you know, getting through COVID and whatever? Coming out the other side, looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Yeah, I think that there is another side. You know what I mean? Like, I think everybody gets, like, hyper-focused sometimes on, like, the day in, day out of, like, being stuck in, you know, like, whether it's lockdown or, like, you know, people's, you know, businesses. Like, I hear about, like, venues and stuff like that, like, being on the brink of closing and, like, all of this. And I, I think it's it's hard to, but, like, to – to have those moments where you can step back and be like, but there is, you know, the sun is going to come up tomorrow and it's going to come up next month, Mm. you know, and it it is in a lot of ways, like just hanging in there and like getting through it that I think 
it needs to be like the light at the end of the tunnel. Like, I don't know when that's going to be, but I know it is going to be. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's like the bigger thing that like, you know, lots of us, like things are going to change, but like people aren't going anywhere, you know? And like, we are going to like have like as much as like, even the venue closure thing, like I think is, is brutal. And I, I feel for like all of the like bars and like small venues that we love going to, but also at the same time, like that's, you know, that's what like hardcore and punk and metal is like all about is like, we'll play wherever, you know, like the vibe for all of us, like, isn't just in, you know, like a place like, like I want chinneries to be around forever because it's like a staple of the community. Mm. But like if, chinneries closed and those guys opened up another space like up the road like that's where we would play and the vibe would be amazing because the people that run the space are like what make it you know what i mean so i think that's the thing is that like we're all in this together and that it doesn't matter where we end up like playing or where your bar ends up being it's like as long as you're like a part of the community and everybody knows like you know that like the the guy who runs the bar and like the sound person and like everyone who's involved in those spaces is like what makes it so rad. So yeah. I think that's like my main thing is like, yeah, times are tough right now, but it's also like, it's going to be, you know, we're all going to be here. Yeah. It's still going to happen. We're gonna, yeah. We're exactly. going to get this happening again. Mm. That's the message. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant been an amazing podcast Liam thank you so much yeah, no, it's been, yeah thanks for having me on guys I'm glad, taking uh, the time of your weekend yeah no worries I uh I gotta go and actually pack up a whole bunch of Treadwell orders is my it's the rest of my evening fair play well, you, go got, for it. you got a few more hours than us so you're a little bit behind us something so. yeah exactly I still have a couple more hours I can get it done Excellent. We're going to go and put Die Hard on. So, <laughs> yeah, hell yeah. We'll check you later. Thanks again. Liam, it's been amazing. Yeah, Thanks so much, guys. buddy. Right on. And uh, yeah, good luck with the podcast. We'll uh, hopefully you get, you get that Zach Wilde interview. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> Maybe. Cheers, mate. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Yeah, you guys Bye. too. Cheers, Take Liam. Thank you. Bye. Bye.